Or to use a window shopper. Mad at me. I think I know why. Show to use a window shopper. Mad as, as you see me ride by. And I'll tell you why I did that in just a moment. Why? Why? You got to tell us why you did that. I'm curious. Uh, well, you gave me some awesome notes to uh, kind of prepare myself. And you, you gave us an opportunity to, to, to pick our bone with the uh, construction or whatever oh, industry so we're in, real estate reason. industry. Okay. So now we'll, we'll talk about that. And it just came right to my mind. And I said, you know what? I'll just do it. Nice. Well, I'm me of high school anyway. No, man, that was great. Thanks. Thanks so much, man, for opening up the show. I appreciate it. And thank you. And welcome. Welcome to be uh, be getting on the show there. I know that we've been chatting for how long all over social media for years and years and years. Absolutely. Yeah, we've seen it go up and down and and up and up and up and up. So I've got Shazad here on the show. So you basically you're a real estate broker, builder. Uh, right. you're dabbling in a bunch of things is what's going on, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, from Long Island, New York. Uh, yeah. and so what else you want me to share? So you want to share that mostly you you spend your energy mostly on social media, on YouTube and IG, right? You focus your business and your networking, your communication all through that, th- those platforms, right? But you still have a website as well too. Absolutely. Pinnacle real estate consulting.com. Uh, it's a link to all my socials and, um, where I found, uh, the best response time and the best, um, engagement with potential clients and supporters has been through uh, Instagram. Um, Isn't that the truth though, in today's day and age, right? We don't look at uh, Yelp or Google anymore. We look at a restaurant, we type it in on Instagram to see what the vibe is, who's tagging it. It's so true, it's so true. And it's highly curated for for most businesses. It's not even usually representative of the actual product necessarily. Yeah, It's very much branding and marketing, but that's what our impulse is now. Instagram, YouTube, um, YouTube we'll talk about, um, we'll, we'll get into that. So yeah. I mean, as, as everyone knows that, you know, we're going to have a very interesting show today cause you've got a lot Thank to share. You. We got a lot to talk about. I've been, I've been itching to get you on the show. So obviously this I show's all going to be about real estate, all about, I, I love that you have those three principles of yours, which you're going to dive into and how to look at this market, how to look at opportunities, how to build everything, how to build your brand. Um, so before we get into that, just a quick shout out to Artistic Skylights. It's the tea that I'm wearing. Uh, awesome. So I'll always be wearing someone else's tea while I'm doing all these shows. So I don't have a wardrobe department. I just take care of the tea. There Everyone sends it to me and that's it. So shout out to them. But Shazad, so over to you, man. Like, how do, Where do you want to begin? Do you want to begin with the construction bone? Let's get that out of the way and just talk about what we have issues with. Well, I have uh, I have a bone to pick with both sides, and I'm I'm in, I'm really very much in two businesses. I'm a spec builder, and I'm a real estate broker. And building kind of led to me setting up my own brokerage and growing my brand as a realtor. So that's always going to be something that's like a, a passion for me. It, it, it's tough. It sucks. It's very hands on. I don't have a project manager. I don't have uh, a big team. Um, I build a few houses a year, and so. I've really gotten to learn the uh, the dark side of yeah. uh, construction, right? Did it and grow out of faults? Did you like? Were you seeing what was missed opportunities and and faults in the industry? And you started saying, "I don't want to do it that way." Is that is that where it came from? Look, I, I wasn't here to reinvent the wheel, but as as I learned the business, I realized that uh, there's there's a big problem. Uh, if you look at construction and you look at like the transparency aspect of it, right? Um, and I sang the window shopper song kind of as, as a point, the, the, the buyer, the client thinks that everything we do is easy. We're a bunch of monkeys swinging hammers, right? Um, I yeah. want to throw a hat on a house. Yeah. Okay. This is how we're talking about restructure and building a second floor on a house that someone is trying to convince me that they're going to live in during that time. Right. Um, and then on the, the builder side, there's so much lacking transparency and um, there's just uh, a lot of smoke and mirrors, especially on social media when it comes to contractors and how the business works. And it's an anxiety inducing pit in your stomach. And I've heard you talk about this. I've heard about so many people talk about this and we're not helping ourselves. We're lying. We're cheating. We're stealing. If we just all were honest with our clients and didn't double dip, you know, on, in my business, I did a little custom building for a while, right? Uh, custom building. And there's two ways to go about it, uh, the GC route or the construction manager route, right? And uh, you got these guys underbidding high-end construction, double dipping on the trades, stealing from everybody every step of the way. And so that's my bone to pick with with the the, the high-end contractor. And generally, you're, you're, you're over here, everything's expensive, right? But you're decent, reasonable, well-known, general contractor is a good guy 
trying to trying to trying to make an honest living. But as soon as the greed kicks in, it becomes such a dirty industry, and and we're dealing with it right now. I I, I through my socials, I I shovel out a lot of high end custom work to one specific partner that I work with, and learning that bid process in today's market we're talking very high end four or five million build out i don't touch that market yeah. um learning how dirty that side of the business was and how how they'll, we did the bid we know the numbers so we know you're lying and we know you're going to stick it to the customer for one million dollars in change orders is there you a know? breaking point she's like is there I know in real estate here in Canada and Toronto, like it's a different ball game. The moment you go above a million dollars, is yeah. it a different ball game when you get to two million, three million? Yeah. It's, it's, so it changes, and then the yeah. mindset of the actual GCs and the tradespeople that mindset changes as well too. Does it get yeah. worse or better? Uh, it gets worse. Okay, because I, I agree with you a hundred percent. It gets worse because. Um, you have suits at that point who are charading as builders coming on the job site in Range Rovers and Gucci loafers. Uh. And, and, and that's where it gets dicey. Like you're showing off your Ferrari on Instagram on the weekend, and then you're going to tell your client that you're going to do and Listen, I'm all about nice things and nice, you know, supporting your life. You know, we don't work this hard for nothing. Yes. You know, I, I'm 100% about enjoying vacationing, sharing that with your followers. People love to know who you are, what you do. That's a big part of my brand. Part of your personality. Uh, it's part of your character. Yeah, absolutely. It's who yeah. you are. And it but be, a lot about be real, it. but be real yeah, about yeah. it. That's the yeah. thing. But yeah. don't act like you're in the trenches, but you're getting out of the job site, uh, in the job site in your loafers uh, and, <laughs> and changing. Uh, it's funny. I see funny stuff, right? Uh, so, I know. And, and so, and I'm a realtor, so I do that too. Let me be clear. I change hats in the middle of the day. I run home and take a shower and come back as a different human being at, at 45 minutes later. So that's very cool. But we'll talk about that later on. But that's my bone to pick with the high-end construction side. And the realtor side, man, I've got a real bone to pick there. And they're got a, they've got a reckoning coming. We're going to talk about this too, right? Um, I want to ask so you, is that the, do we, either if you're a, a, like a smaller GC or a smaller business or even a higher end, you start doing multi-million dollar projects. Yeah. Are we doing this because we feel the clients are not prepared or willing to listen to the truth? Are we just assuming things, which is definitely the wrong way to go? But is that part of the reason why we act the way we act? Uh, we feel the, um, I guess it's kind of like government. We feel that, you know, the citizens don't want to know the whole truth. So then we won't yeah, tell yeah. them the whole oh, truth. Yeah. Is that what we're doing to the clients? We're just, we feel that they don't want to hear it. Are you talking about like where the market's going? and are No, no, like why we would take advantage market? or why you, the greed kicks in, why that sleaziness, you know, that classic stereotype of that GC where homeowners have a, a very good idea about it. And basically all the faults that you're presenting, just the stereotypes. Are we doing that because of we don't think the client, if we told them the truth, like the, the reality, the, honestly, is that if we told them exactly what it was going to cost to the penny, I think deep down we're thinking as a GC, they're never going to say yes never to this project and they won't move forward on it then. So we nope. kind of have to go lower and yeah. then get them in there. But I guess there's a breaking point at that point, right? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think that uh, the fault also lies in the consumer, right? That thinks our job is easy. Yes. And I didn't come on here and to come here to knock buyers and, and oh. to knock regular homeowners. But the reality is, is that a, the TV has made everything seem super easy because they only show you the pretty stuff. That's, that's a big problem in our industry. Yeah. And then B, um, in my market, they think that you can just like go and pick up a guy at Home Depot and it's just, and him doing your bathroom is the same thing as you hiring some of the guys that I've learned from on this platform. A you know, skilled uh, tradesperson. Yeah. Yes. And, and I, it used to blow my mind because I, I started doing very, very small jobs, a bathroom, a kitchen just to fill in. I had a foreman and help. It was, a, we'll get into it. It was a mess. Yes. And what I learned is that used to blow my mind. How could somebody charge 15 or 20 or $25,000 for a five by eight bath? Now I understand why. Yes. But as a 24 year old kid or 22 year old kid in the business, you're like, okay, the materials cost this much. If I get a guy to do this for this price and this for this price, I can get a bathroom done for five or $8,000, right? I used to do it too. Yeah. And they're still fine. 10 years later, they're fine. But the reality is, is that if you got a skilled tradesperson for each job and you did it the right way, you can't possibly do a washroom, it's uh, a bathroom for less than a certain number, yeah, you, can. you know? I and know. so homeowners contribute to this problem. Contractors are not willing to come clean about the cost. 
So how I've personally dealt with it is I come right out of the gate because I turn away a lot of work, you know, not because I'm too good for it, but because, you know, at some point you have to learn to say no. You're vetting. Or have, you're just, or have you're good vetting. Or have yeah, partners to refer all, a good workout to. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell people, I don't mind sitting down with them, giving them, you know, having a conversation over the phone or, or whatever. Um, because, you know, it helps my realtor side of the business too, to learn about what they're doing and, and what their next move is. It's sometimes, should I build on my house or sell it? Right. So this is a good conversation to entertain. But what we basically go over right off the bat is like, this is your per square foot cost. And anybody that tells you otherwise is lying to you. And if it's not a big project where I can give you a per square foot cost, I'm just going to tell you right off the bat that this five by eight bathroom is going to cost you 20 grand. And if somebody can do it for less, you're more than welcome to hire them. But by the time you do your roof, your three bathrooms, your kitchen, whatever, you're going to spend a couple hundred thousand on your house, right? And at that point, is it worth it to sell it? Is it worth it to trade up? Is it worth it to jump into something during construction so you can customize it the way you want? And, and I give my clients all of those options with re references to back it up. So that's been how I've combated this kind of like funky side of the business. Um, do you, I want to ask you, do, do you, I know that we tell clients all the time, get three GCs or get three tradespeople to give yeah. you three, a minimum three quotes, right? Yeah. So you yeah. can try to figure out which two are similar and which yeah. one is too low Not, and yeah. too high. Yeah. But are clients doing the same thing with real estate agents? Are they actually looking and interviewing and discussing it? Are they going to three or are they just taking it on a whim that so-and-so said, you know what, here's a good person, meet with them, talk to them, and that's it. But should they be looking or speaking to three different real estate agents? So this is how social media has changed the landscape on that side of the business, right? The, the dinosaurs who still do monster volume are doing it based on the business they've created over the last 30 years, right? 40 years, some of those folks, right? So the people that weren't in the game before social media have built a real business, right? Then in comes social media and basically a generation of um, millennials that, that, that have only seen an up market since they actually started paying attention, Isn't that right? The truth, never even got never seen it, anything right? negative. No. So I was like a weird kid, right? I was like this kind of like chubby, uh, funny kid, you know, first generation. I knew I was the man before I actually could show that I was the man, right? You know, this young, yeah. funny kid. I was a firstborn immigrant family. Uh, I learned the value of hard work very, very early, right? And I would follow the stock market. Like I vividly remember the tech bust of 2000 because my pops had his money in tech stocks. And the look on his face is all you needed to know to understand what happened that day, yes. right? I was in high school at the time or just about to enter high school. And so um, 10, 12, 13 years old, I'm sitting there talking about stocks with my dad and like, you know, reading the, you know, the, never was like an A plus student, but was that B plus student without trying kind of guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. That was me. Yeah. And so. Uh, but A plus in I, life. You were learning A plus. No, in no, 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 not even. No, not yet. I had a downturn. Okay. We can talk about that. That's, right. that's fun. We'll we need, a, need a little downturn. bit of experience and we need a little bit of oh, loss to actually get the A plus land. Major loss, man. Yes, major yes. loss. A lot of struggle. But then, thank God, you know, uh, it was it. But, you know, by the Great Recession, I was fully in the game. You know what I mean? So I understood what was going on, but I didn't have the money to, to, to take action, right? Yep. Uh, I got into business right after the recession. So I remember swatting flies at open houses. I remember begging people to come back for a second showing. You know, this is something that's built into me. I remember pre-pandemic saying there's a recession coming. Okay, openly. But even your beginning point, that would have been what? 2008 when and, it would have been the housing collapse? When I got in the business. Yeah, that's when you got in, huh? Wow, was that? that must have been difficult to get into the business at that time. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know when when we're gonna touch on it, but I would love to explain very briefly to my viewer, to, to your viewers, how I got in the business. Yeah, well, I want to hear all about it for sure. Yeah, and and also I would love to provide some value from the business standpoint. Feel free to ask questions, you know, um, both from the realtor side and the construction side, because like I said earlier, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. And I'd love to give a little bit of insight into the business side of it, of how no one gives you, this is what I hate about social media, right? I have so many bones to pick. I got a big chip on my shoulder. I'm not shy about it. You know, this is Shares. my Shares, not share. I want you to share because I've got the same bones, man. Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's insane. I, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little, I'm a little seasoned beyond my age. Right. So I've seen a, a fair amount of shit. And so. How young are you, man? 
I'm 35. I'm okay. going to be 36 yeah, in a yeah, few weeks. Yeah, but, no, you, you've got you got a few years on those uh, those experience years. Yeah, no, no, for, for sure. sure. And, and I st- I moved out of my house when I was 17 years old, right? A lot of kids are still live, you know, I moved back in, moved back out. But for the most part, I was on my own after 18 years old. So nice. it was it, 35, 15 years of working is enough time to realize that it's a cold, hard world, world out there, you know? So how did um, it feel for you? Housing collapse in the U.S., we didn't really have a collapse here in yeah. uh, in Canada. We're going to have a collapse here. I don't care because I'm sure that you've been paying attention. I'm still trying to grasp why Canada, Toronto, and Vancouver is so expensive to buy regarding real estate. Yeah. Globally speaking, it's so expensive. Yeah, yeah. And we're we're going to have a collapse. I guarantee you we're going to have a collapse, right? And we, I mean, like you, I was saying this before the pandemic. I was like, something's happening. Something's going to happen. And okay. sure enough, everyone's getting whiff of it. And now the corporations start jumping on board. And now they start basically repeating what other people have been saying on social media for the longest time. You going into the housing collapse, so you're talking about late 2008, 2009 kind of thing. How did that feel like knowing that you were struggling to get an open house, struggling to get a client to go look at a property? How was that? So I got to take you back a little bit. Okay. Um, I grew up in, in, my father was an accountant growing up. Okay. And uh, real estate was always something in our blood. As a kid, we would like fix up a house. When I mean fix up, I mean literally paint and carpet and just rent it out. Right. Hold it for a couple of years. Money was easy. You sell it. And I didn't grow up with a lot of money, right? First generation, my father was came here 19 years old, really, really worked hard. I learned my work ethic from him. Got on the train every morning. Where's the know. family from? I'm curious. So um, my grandparents from India, yes. they migrated to Pakistan during the partition. The British did a nice job of carving up India, making a whole mess of it. <laughs> That's a whole and, other and, podcast. Yeah. And, 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 so, and I, I, um, I disagree with the British. I'm sorry, but yeah. yeah. A, lo- a, lot of, a lot of Indians were forced to move due to the religious, you know, the differences yes. and whatever. So we ended up, my parents were born in Pakistan. Okay. Uh, my father came here in 1972, which is, for anybody from India or Pakistan is very early. You know, in terms of most of the people from India and Pakistan came in the 80s. You know, and obviously now that continues to this day. Yes. Um, but growing up in, a, in, 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 you know, where like you, I lived in a really nice town and went to school with a bunch of rich kids, but we didn't have it like that. Right. So that was a big part of what shaped me going I- I into real estate as, you know, uh, even as young as like I got my real estate license when I was 18 years old. Right. Whoa. This was in 2005. Is there an okay. age limit? There's no age limit. Right. As 18. long as you is there 18. 18 is the 19, age limit. Yeah. I apologize. 19, 2005. I got it. Right. Wow. And good for you, man. I had failed out of school at that point. Uh, I went to school for one year in Buffalo. I came home a disaster. Uh, bad habits, bad friends. We don't, you know, we could get into that another time. The circle. Um, I know your reflection. Just, uh, nonsense. A real f up, you know. And so uh, when I came back, I was like, "Let me deliver some pizza. Let me get, you know, that's the only job you can make twenty bucks an hour as a kid, right?" And so Plus I got tips. into, got my real estate license. I thought I got my first deal. Okay. And it was the guy who made the pizza behind the counter. He was making $1,000 a week and had three mortgages at the time was going for his fourth. All stated income, all nonsense. So when I tell you I've been in the game 20 years, it's, it's hard to hear that from somebody who's as young as me. Yeah. But I remember trying to sling a deal. And it was a great house. Well-built, Bethpage, New York, you know, 500000 would be worth eight hundred today if you weathered the storm. But you can on an, on an adjustable rate mortgages mortgage when you're making a thousand a week and you have four mortgages. It ain't happening, sweetheart. You know, wow. and so that deal fell through, Great. and I got discouraged and I dropped out of the business and I really effed up after that. A year or two, dabbled, went back to college, got a degree in accounting. I paid for my entire college education because after I failed out of school the first time, it's your own dime after that, pal. Yes. You know what I mean? And that's so a, that's how really it should tough. be. That's how it should yeah. be. I'm just no, saying. Yes. I had a scholarship the first time I blew it. And so, no, financial aid and a little bit of scholarship. I basically was going to Buffalo for free right by you guys. Not far. Yeah. And, you know, and so um, after after I came back and went back to school and, and, and was graduating college in the middle of the recession, 2009, I specifically remember my senior level accounting professor coming into my classroom and saying, you kids don't understand what just happened, but Lehman Brothers just went under. Mm. And this is when I'm entering the job market, you know? So, and, and, and I digress, but you were painting a picture of nine or 10. I really want you to know, like, that's what we were dealing with mentally. I had just gotten an internship that semester with the best accounting firm or one of the best, PwC, right? And so my path was kind of like, take the $56,000 a year job, get your master's while you're going to school, 
They'll bump that up to 75 or 80, and then you'll slowly climb that public accounting or tax ladder. Um, I was the worst intern in the history of PwC. <laughs> I, 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 I had- You didn't have a love for it, right? You just didn't have uh, a love for it? Man, I realized I didn't want to do it. And I, at, the, at the time it was $25 an hour, it was like a $10,000 eight week summer gig. So I wasn't going to turn that away, but I knew within a few days that this is not for me. So I started studying for law school. Um, you know, this is while the market is tanking, Lehman went under. The government's bailing out everybody. Everybody. Okay. I throw a little money in the stock market. You know what I mean? I'm making a little hustling, selling tickets, selling other things. You're just doing whatever the hell I can. And in 05, 06, my, my pops, you know, when I was in high school, he changed careers. He got laid off when I was in high school, decided that he wanted to pursue real estate as a, as a job, not a side hustle. And it's not easy, man. You know, like you're, you know, you're, you're starting out in your fifties and, and you're changing careers and you're not to survive as a realtor is a very tough gig. Very, yeah. very tough. And we'll talk about the realtor gig. It's very tough to and actually do the work, to physically do the work instead no, of having the, the perfect business. property, right? When you have a perfect property, that's a different story, but when you got to do the work, yeah, it's different. The, the real the, what makes the realtor side of the business tough is that to build that book of business, you have to have people that have worked with you in the past. And when you're, when, when you're, when you're, yeah, you'll get one or two listings from a friend or neighbor or whatever, but to sustain, to make enough money to live, it's very tough. So he quickly dabbled in building. Right. And then the recession came, they made no money. They broke even on some. And basically how I fell in was basically they took a, a probably about a two to three year break. Okay. And I was going to school and I was working and I was just trying to figure out my life. And I, and I was this close to law school, man, this close. I had taken the review course. I had paid the $1,500 for the test masters and got my letters of recommendation. I was this close. And my now wife, we had a one bedroom studio, a thousand bucks a month. And I looked at her and I closed the book and I literally said, I said, I'm not doing this. You know, this sucks. You know, I'm not going to go work for the man. I shouldn't say that, but I'm not going to go work for the man. Corporation. When, whatever yeah. especially as a lawyer like it was just tough you know like for me as a decision um and so i had saved up a little bit of money i raised money from like 20 different friends uh, i borrowed some money from family members and I, we bought our first house and at what age was this this was 2010 it was a short sale before anybody knew what a short sale was okay okay and it took about a year to close year and a half because back then short sales took forever red tape red tape red tape and I vividly remember literally learning on the job. We hired a framer, you know, who did a good job. Uh, we, we, we had an electrician who we still have to this day. And we were all just kind of man in the van operations. I don't want to act like this was anything more than like a couple of people figuring this shit out, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. a lofty aspiration to just become a builder. You know what I mean? It's very, almost an arrogant thing. And now everyone with a couple of dollars is a builder, right? But like, Back then, it was it was pretty ambitious. But twelve yeah. years ago, you were looking at it. Did you guys sit down and came up with a list of what we need to do? So then, when we sell this, this is what we're going to maximize our return on investment. Yeah, and and we crushed it. It was okay. even it, it was we sold the house in two thousand twelve because it took about a year to go through the whole. It was a variance, and we had to you know basically do a little foundation extension and basically build a new house. This wasn't a flip, you know. This was our my first project, and um. We scraped it together and we made great money. I mean, if it was that, if it was, if I could build for that cost now, I'd be a, yeah, I'd be you'd a billion, be very happy, I you know? know, but it doesn't um, work like that now. Absolutely not. But what I realized after building two houses with my pops is that it's great to be able to have that background and have that communication of like two people at different places in their lives, but kind of learning the business at the same time. I realized that if I was going to kind of do it the way I wanted to do it, and this is not a knock for, on my pops at all. I just needed to kind of go my own route, yeah. you know? So I went to raise money from investors route, okay? So what made my business different is that I, I went on equity. I did not want to mess with hard money. I have certain religious limitations. Um, so I avoid interest-based finance whenever possible. And it's mind-blowing to people that are in business and leverage and real estate because they're like, how the hell do you even do real estate without interest? But yes. it's complicated and I explain it, but to put it in like two words, um, equity based partners is how I equity based, meaning I went out, I got investors and I basically said, you put up the money, 
I put up the sweat equity. I don't get paid $1 until you get paid. So I would build an entire house, okay? With a, we'd have a little funny one-page, two-page contract between the two of us, but the investor owned the property and provided the funds for the construction. And as I got a little more established, I would invest in the project as well to try to get that little bit of return also. Um, but essentially, I was saying, I'm betting on myself. If I can't make you money, then I then I don't make anything. So the that, only thing they had to do was basically be willing to say, take the risk. All right, the deal is not good enough. If the deal is good enough up front, I'm not going to lose money. Worst case, I'll break even. You know. But let, let me let me ask you this: Is so yeah. can you do that today? Because I know of a lot of GCs here in the Greater Toronto area, even probably parts of Canada, they're having a hard time doing that because I think a lot of equity partners. They want you to put as much skin in the game regarding equity, not just so much the sweat equity. Absolutely. Right. So it's like, can you do that today? Is that possible to do it today? So I talk about this all the time on my on my Instagram. And I, and I really and very briefly, I never got to finish the thought. My bone to pick is with the social media influencers and social media motivational speakers. They never give you the real shit about how they oh. actually got a little lucky or there was a little help. Or I just so happen to have X, Y, and Z fall into place for me. And I'm not hating. But at least give people the real story, right? Yes. So uh, what was your question again? I <laughs> no, I just, can you do what you did when you took that risk 12 yes. years, 10 years ago? Can so you I, do that today? Can I do that tomorrow? Can I go find an equity partner tomorrow, talk to them and go, listen, I will put all the sweat equity in. I have all the construction knowledge in there. Will you partner with me and do that? Is that a possibility today? Yes. And so exactly. Thank you for bringing me back to my thought. So uh, this is what I talk about on my Instagram, that this whole get rich quick scheme nonsense, this whole zero money down, make money with real estate with other people's money. Just stop it. I know, okay. It's, it's not sustainable. Yes. And you guys have just come out of hiding after 10 years. You're about to get wiped out again. Just stop with the bullshit. Right. So my focus, and if I was that person right now trying to find an equity-based partner or even find somebody with hard money to lend me money, which I don't you know, involve myself with, but that's an option to investors like myself, is you have to bring one of three things. Either you have to find the deal, okay, or you have to provide the skilled labor, yep. or you have to provide the capital. If you don't have one of the three, it's just not happening, right? So if you bring the deal... And you explain to that investor today, right now, if I was starting from scratch and I didn't have any money, but after door knocking for six months, I got one house, just one deal, okay? I would get that person in contract, somehow get the 10% down from somewhere, somehow bullshit your way to that 5% to sign the contract. And then I would go to every investor I know. And now you can just type in on Instagram, you can type in on, you can find a hundred people in your market in one second. So Shazad, you know? hang on, just backtrack one second. I need you to repeat something that you just said that's paramount. That's absolutely paramount. You door knock for six months to get one deal. You didn't create a video that's 15 seconds that oh. showed you that you got this oh, deal. No. You door knocked for six months to get yeah. one deal. Done it, I've done it. The majority of my deals are still from door knocking and relationships that I built through door knocking or social media or whatever. And it's maybe I get a hundred solicit if, if I get a hundred bites, I probably will buy one. That's, you know? the, that's the ratio. That's true. Yeah. Everyone needs to understand that. Otherwise, man. Yeah. There, otherwise there's no money in the deal. If you buy wrong, you're out, you're dead. You're dead before you put a nail on the ground. And I've been there. I've broken even a few times. By broken even, I mean, I made enough money to like, you know, ten dollars an hour, maybe by the time I was done. You know, but if I didn't do those twenty or thirty builds, you know, I built about thirty-five homes now, right? Nice. I would say the first we made a, a good chunk of change on my first couple, like compared to now, because now, like the you know, it's it's tight. But uh, as a percentage, I'm talking about. Um, but now, um, but as a know, business person, as an entrepreneur, you're always looking at your ROI. You're Absolutely. you're calculating, trying to figure out, and obviously you know it for a fact that you're you're doing all this work, and you know that there's going to be some projects that are you're barely going to break even, right? Yeah. And you might yeah. even lose a little bit of money, but yeah. I mean you're anticipating what the next project's going to be like, and yeah. hopefully you do get twenty points, thirty points. Then maybe yeah. you get lucky on that one, yeah. and you get like fifty points, and then it grows. But the majority of it is that you're breaking even, and you're yeah. getting those unicorns once in a while. Yeah. So the 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 way that 
thankfully, the way that I've been able to kind of avoid the break-evens is by buying right and having that background in real estate and, and actually being an active realtor, you know when you've got a deal. There's no speculation, right? I know in the six or eight towns that I'm willing to build in what a knockdown should trade for today retail and what I'm willing to pay for it. And if there's no spread there, you're not going to make money. And, 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 that's, and that's the bottom line. And people say, well, you're stealing a house from somebody. No, I don't lowball anybody. And I hate the people that try to do that. The knock on someone's door, like, I'll give you 200000 knowing damn well that house is worth 500000 That's yeah. bullshit, yeah. right? What I say to this person is, look, this is what your house would trade for today. You have open permits. You have violations. You have overgrown this. You have that. You have this. You'll never sell a house to a buyer with a mortgage. Leave whatever you want behind. I'm buying cash. If you need six months to move out, goodbye. If you need to close in 30 days, goodbye. No problem. But no smoking mirrors, no bullshit. We're not stealing an old lady's house, right? But how I avoided breaking even and how I kind of got comfortable with like my, you know, we all have a certain margin that we try to hit, right? For sure. Was I worked so cheap for the first five or six years of my investors, man. I was making shit money, shit money. And I, I, the young people need to hear this because I've had this, uh, I met my wife in 2008, right? And she toughed it out with me from zero. And for a while, I was sitting there like, yo, I could just be an accountant, work nine to five, come home and forget about my job. Oh, yeah. What You know, you, you have other questions in the interview that I know you want to get to. And like, you know, like you made me think about something, uh, you know, like a construction sounds you hate. Yeah, yeah. Sounds, we'll we'll get to all those. But yeah, no, I totally. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Just, just long story short, if, if you're not willing to work cheap and work hard for 10 years, you're never going to see the fruits of your labor. But and, I mean, that's the that, problem, isn't it? Shazad? Like that's the problem today in yeah. today's generation. Everybody wants instant gratification. They want that gold mine right away. They don't want to do that work. They got to understand that everybody has been on this show and they start sharing their story and where their humble beginnings came from. There was so much work. It's no different than this show itself. This is like show number two, 278 or whatever. Like I, I was yeah. looking back and going, it's been four and a half plus years that I've been doing this show. The show like, it's, it's because of the conversation. So you ask anybody in social media, go ahead and do 300 shows. You know what I mean? Give yourself all this other time. And there's also it's the same thing in construction. So many times that I've spoken to GCs or tradespeople and they've done that extra amount of work just for to, to satisfy, to basically build their brand so they can get another job. There is so much work before and after all the lights and camera and all that glitz and glam. People don't see it. They don't. And then when you tell them what it is, they don't want it. The majority of people don't want to go down that path. And that's why I never blew up. That's why I'm not blown up. That's why I'm just a guy with a local business with 12,000 amazing supporters. I delete the robots. Get the F out of here. I don't even want to see you on my page. Okay. And a couple thousand YouTube subscribers. But I give that small percentage of the population that want that real shit. And I just give it to them. Yeah. And you're speaking to people real people, people at that point. I'm too dry yeah. or I'm too uh, straight up or like, yo, Shazad's really straightforward. All good. I can live with that. You know? Let me, let me take a small pause here. Just to, I want to do the history and construction segment here. I don't want to yeah. interrupt you because, I mean, I'm loving this. Honestly, no, no, I'm loving this. So we'll yeah. keep on talking as long as you give me, and then we'll keep on going yeah, from yeah. there. Yeah, no, let's, let's do that. Uh, uh, world's most expensive homes, all prices that are in U.S. dollars here. Uh, Buckingham Palace, do you have any idea what that costs? Uh, <laughs> only, only reason I have a rough idea is was that everyone was phoning over the queen. Yes. Um, you know, God rest her soul. I... I was. Um, they talked about the what this uh, real estate portfolio is worth, and I believe Buckingham Palace is worth close to a billion dollars, if I'm not mistaken. It's Six point seven billion. Oh, okay. Two hundred and fifty yeah, okay. square feet. Uh, Two hundred and fifty square feet. Two hundred and fifty thousand square feet. Uh, Seven hundred and seventy-five rooms. Two hundred and forty bedrooms. Seventeen. Nineteen staterooms. Ninety-two offices and seventy-eight bathrooms. Man, can you imagine having that contract? Uh, Antilla, <laughs> Antilia, India. It's uh, that house is worth two billion. It's four hundred thousand square feet. Uh, and then Villa Leopolda, which is in France, that house is worth seven hundred and fifty million, eighty thousand square feet. Um, wow. And then the one in the United States, it's worth five hundred million, and it's a hundred thousand square feet, owned by Niall Naomi. Uh, nine bedrooms, multiple kitchens, nightclub, four lane bowling alley, a salon, a home gym, 50 seat theater, running track, swimming pool, a moat that surrounds the whole place, man. 
that house was ne never finished. Uh, was it really? In it's been in litigation for a long time. Yeah, that house is an absolute disaster. Uh, What's the reasoning behind the litigation? Uh, I, I think that the first developer went bankrupt and sold it. And uh, it's, a, it's a whole long a protracted mess. thing. But wow. sometimes you bite off more than you can chew. And that is the, the grandest example of, uh, of that. All right. So, so where, okay. So now you're, it's, I find it always interesting that you find the woman that's going to be with you or your partner during the hardest of times, like you're going at the beginning of your career and everything's yeah. getting started. And it's nice that you find someone that could see you for who you are and who you could possibly be. Right. And then understand where you're coming from. And likewise too, you return the favor to them as well. And, sure. uh, and you grow together, but it's like, I, I love the fact that it, we're talking about something that happened 12 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago. Yeah. And here we are today. Um, yeah. I really want to shift gears. Yeah. The recession next year. And what's going to happen to the whole landscape here? Like what's, I mean, both of ours, without getting too political, both of our governments are completely lost at what's really lost going their on. Way. Lost their way. Like completely lost. lost. And it's just, are yeah. we just being so blinded, not realizing that something massive is coming next year? What are your thoughts on that? So we're prepared. Um, and as an investor, I'm always all in on the street as well. So I bring that value to my clients. And how I'm looking at it is it really comes down to what metro market you're in, right? What local market you're in. Where I am in Long Island, um, within a certain distance of New York City, right? My, my radius is like an hour uh, east of New York City it is, is as far as we'll go. As a realtor, I'll go all the way out to Montauk and the Hamptons, which is, you know, not my specific market, but I'll serve a client anywhere on the island. It's, you know, it's a massive island. Apparently, Long Island is one of the biggest islands in the entire world. And nice. so we're, we are a suburb of New York City we're going to be all right. Okay. That's what it comes down to last recession too, which was really a housing recession. It was a, it was a collapse of, of mortgage backed securities. It was a collapse of the bad bets that the criminals on wall street made. And we got stuck with the bag as, as the, uh, the homeowners, we are the ones who suffer the loss of equity whenever there's a major economic, economic downturn. Yeah. That's we one of the best definitions I heard about it. Like her, you know, describing it. That's exactly what it was. You know, yes. That's what it comes down to. It was a massive redistribution of wealth. And what I'm seeing now is that sort of happening again. Okay. Happened already, actually. That is past tense. Yes. Right. Yeah. So now the market is reacting to that hyperinflation and, 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 and purposely constricting supply chains and all the things that have happened in the last 24 months are setting the table for us getting wiped out again. So as a, as a homeowner, as a buyer or a seller, or just in general, an investor, how, how do you survive? And what am I advising my clients? Very straightforward. If you buy right, you're going to be all right. If you're chasing a whim, if you're chasing a dream, if you're going outside of your comfort zone in terms of what you can afford, you're in for a lot of pain in the next 24 months. Now is Anybody not the time bought, to be risky, right? Like now is oh, not, to, no, right? Not now. Okay. Not right this minute. And, and I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm all in. I swear to God, I'm all into it like an absurd. And I, I've built my business being all in. If I actually told you how all in I've been uh, over the last 10 years, I would only have been able to do this uh, if, if, if I was, uh, you know, control, like controlling my lifestyle and controlling yeah. my, you know, I live in a thousand square foot, fully renovated little ranch that I bought eight years ago. And my client asked me, oh, you must have built yourself a crazy house. Absolutely not. Keeping the taxes tight. It's just me and my wife. It's a beautiful house. Everything works. I Smart. renovated it, Home Depot style, ten years Smart. ago. Gut reno. Smart. I'm rolling. There's nothing. There's nothing. There's no magic to it. I'd love to build a dormer, or have a big house on a hill one day, or, or or a farm. Really is what I want. But you know, um, it's not realistic. And if you don't keep it tight right now, you're in big trouble. You know, whether you're an investor, a buyer. You know, if you bought in the last year, I believe that you're going to be all right no matter what. Okay. Okay. Because they're making housing a luxury, not a necessity that it used to be. People are not going to own homes anymore. They're going to rent. And if you own a home and if you really did lock a good rate, and if you really did buy at a decent, like without like being like emotional about it, you're going to be all right. You know, whereas the last time we weren't No. because they were based on bad bets. They were based on bad loans. And the economy was just going up, right? Everything was looking great. Everything was looking amazing, sunny, and everything was great. Nobody thought this would happen. I want to ask you, what, what, was, at what moment or what was the spark that told you that 
I guess, pre-pandemic and then right now coming up to a potential res a recession next year. What was it to you that you started realizing, wait a minute, something's going to happen here. This this can't continue this path. Um, was there something that was said, something that was done in the market that was like, what was it? You know, since the last recession to now, um, people are much more reactive now, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're digesting information at a much faster clip. So if you have a few listings or a few builds across, I'd like to say we have a very nice uh, sample size of a market here. I have, you know, your entry level five, six hundred thousand dollar house further in Suffolk County. And then I have your mega mansion on the Gold Coast Gatsby style 20 million. Right. So I get to have my finger on the pulse of a lot of markets. And I think it's a microcosm of what the overall market in the United States looks like. Um, aside from like those places where no one wants to live anyway, you know, I'm talking about like your, your, your major, uh, markets, right? Let's put it that way without hurting anybody's feelings, your major, <laughs> your, your, your big real estate markets. So I think that if you don't, um, I lost my train of thought. Where were we? We're gonna no, if, if you're, I, I guess it's, if you're, you're trying to think of how did this all, how did we get to this point? This how do we get to this point? Yeah. So, so. I think that we can actually decouple. This is controversial. Go I ahead. think we can actually decouple recession and the housing market for just a minute and look at them separately. We're heading to, into a recession from a consumer standpoint because people have were spending more than they can afford. They printed a heck of a lot of money. They were overpaying people for what they should have been being paid for for sitting at home, and now they flooded the economy with with demand. And, and, and people have spent all their money. It's gone now. We're in for a lot of pain. Wait till the holiday season numbers come out in January and February, right? So that's the moment that I see that, 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 like, that, like, that moment where you realize, shit, we're broke or like, shit, we got a real problem, right? But I think we can uncouple the housing market from the recession that's coming, at least from like a demand standpoint, because there is still a major housing shortage here in the States. And if you have a good house and you messed up your money, there are so many people waiting to take your spot right now that I think the housing market will be okay. Remember, the boomers, um, they, they wrecked havoc on the economy over the last 30 years in their own way. And in a lot of ways, the millennials are kind of stuck holding the bag for a lot of the policy, especially over the last 10 or 15 years. Was it the but generational wealth from the boomers? Is that what it was that they did so well? And they had all this excess of money, but it was, easy. it was easier. I hate to say this. I hate to be offensive, easier, right? no. but it was easier, man, because my father started with zero and I started with zero. Right. And I, I you know, the darker chapters, you know, I, I mentioned that I moved out. I was really on my own, man. I was really on my own and I had a lot of bad habits. So I, I know what it feels like to start from zero and um, uh, pay your way little by little into like, take those little steps and do what you got to do to kind of survive. And, um, I I'm telling you, I'm so lucky I met my good luck charm in 2008 because it was very freaking rocky before that time. Um, Could have been worse. Could have been worse, man. Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And so I really think that we're going to be okay as long as we stay focused on like follow the macro trends, but also focus on your micro. Like you, you can't, nobody can change your situation besides you. And if you let the macro trends really affect your, at the end of the day, man, this is how I look at it, right? We're all collecting squirrels. We're, we're all squirrels collecting acorns. Yeah. I just want to yeah. collect enough acorns so that I can coast for a little while, right? Yeah. And I think that the concept of net worth has been taken out of financial literacy. The concept of not having to work for the rest of your life or own, having – you got all these gurus on Instagram telling us about passive income but not giving us a real path to getting there, you know? Um, or building something in general, yeah. just building a legacy of your own. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, so it's, I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a real wacko when it comes to the legacy thing, man. People are like, you know, you should hire this person. You should hire that person. Every person you hire, you're taking responsibility for their family. You're taking responsibility. Oh, you're sure. taking the best years of their life. For sure. You know what I mean? So I had a foreman. I had a helper. I have a couple of realtors that work, work for me on the side and part-time. My wife's also a realtor with me. But... The reality is, is that I'm so high risk and I'm so focused on my end goal that I'm not willing to take anybody along on that ride without being abundantly clear with them right off the bat that like, dude, I see myself one leg out and one leg in the last 10, in the next 10 years. You clearly tell them this is where I'm going. That's where I'm going. Is that where yeah. you're going? Then that we're going there going. together. Yeah. As simple yeah, as that. I'm going. I want to ask you, um, 
are you seeing an uptick? And I know I've seen this in Canada about, uh, I guess, multi ownership of property. So now you're getting corporations in out West that you're getting a property and splitting it up on three different floors and you're selling each floor as a mortgage. So now you're getting three owners on the same property. Are you guys seeing that as well? And then the other question really quickly, you could probably answer me is, um, Variable or fixed, man, because I know that right now in Canada, anybody that got variable is royally enjoying the Vaseline. You know what I mean? Like, it's really, really bad. So your thoughts on that? Uh, so about the rates, um, in, the, in the States, adjustable rate mortgages are getting more popular now because they're giving people an opportunity to, to, to lock in a lower rate, and they're betting on rates coming back down uh, in the next two to three years. And it's very possible that just like the Fed overcorrected to kind of like stem inflation, they're going to uh, overcorrect uh, uh, again and, 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 and stifle the economy so much that they're going to be forced to cut rates again. So it's not I, I hate this philosophy of like um, dating a rate because there's no guarantee that rates are going to come back down. But here in the States adjustable rate mortgages are just now getting a little bit popular again, but because of how bad the last recession was that's why, and how badly people got slaughtered by those balloon rate, you know, mortgages and those, those adjustable rates and people financing 105% of the purchase price, they weren't as popular. So I don't believe that that's going to be as big of an issue with the economy here. Okay. Whereas you guys, like you mentioned, uh, which was a very valuable insight, you guys didn't have the major housing collapse that no. we had in 2009. And 10, you know, our collapse really didn't come until after the stock market tanked in March of 2009. Yeah. That's when we really started to feel the pain. Yeah. Um, so multi, but, multi ownership, is that, is that a I, thing going I, on with you guys? It's, so I'm, I'm very much in a single family market. Um, there are some multifamily that we deal with in Queens and Brooklyn and, and whatever, but I'm not personally involved in them. And here it's very strict. And, and we'll talk about building departments and architecture review boards and stuff like that. But as far as like the zoning here uh, with the towns that I deal with, it's very tightly controlled and there's very little multifamily. There's very little opportunity. Like I love what you guys do or even like markets like, uh, you know, S Seattle, for example, or whatever, where they'll just take a, a, a old house, knock it down and build a triplex, yeah. right? Yeah. We don't have that. Either. A lot of that is happening. Yeah. I, I, I wish, I mean, we had the land out East. Suffolk County is massive. It gets real boony out there. I'm not kidding. Like, you know, if you but go But that's far where you can East, own, right? You're, you're getting the baby boomers who don't need three floors. They only, and they don't want to move to a condo. You know, and they it's it's about basically aging in place. They want to stay where their last home, but they have all this extra space. So they start thinking, well, let's rent out the main floor. Let's rent out yeah. the basement and, and start selling and making some equity out as a result of it and not using the entire building, right? Oh, they it's, don't let us do that at all. Here. That's a shame, man. That's a shame. Yeah. Even if you were to want to build it from scratch and make it code compliant. They won't give it to you. The zoning won't allow it unless you're buying such a large tract of land where a regular person can't benefit from it anyway. True. You know, I don't want to sound like a like a pessimist, but the reality is, is that it's all set up so that you can't make that jump from being rich to wealthy. I agree with you, man. It's set up I agree so that you. you can be well off. You can post pictures in your BMW, guilty. And you can do like all kinds of like nice things, take a nice vacation once a year or whatever. But the reality is, and that's where I focus my energy for the last five, six years. And I've kind of scaled back a little bit on building um, and just in general killing myself because like I'm not worth it if I'm dead. Like it doesn't do anything for me. But, but that's where I'm focusing my energy right now. You know, like getting out of the rat race because it's really set up so that like you just never are able to make that jump because you're always going to want more, right? You're always going to want more. The next car, the next house, the next whatever. And how is, how is it dealing with the building departments there? I can only assume that New York's pretty strict on on who does and who doesn't. And, and I guess there's a lot of regs and rules and all kinds of stuff. Is that the case? Uh, everything is... Um, Everything is is tightly controlled. You got to follow the rules. And, and that's where I found a little bit of success is that you just can't try to outsmart anybody, whether it's the building inspector or the person that's sitting at the desk and you treat people with respect. As long as you follow the rules and you're willing to wait your turn, you're going to be all right. Okay. 
some places more than others. It's very cost prohibitive to build in a certain town where I, where I live, a township where there's like six or seven towns, because you're looking at six to nine months for a permit if there's nothing that needs to be revised. That long, huh? Yes. Wow. So where I work, it's three, four months, uh, roughly, uh, the majority of my builds. And, you know, between the two townships I work in, I cover about 15 or 20 towns. And I feel very comfortable with their building departments. And I also feel comfortable in the smaller villages because you can always hire the right help. You know, you can always hire the right architect or the right zoning attorney, and you can make things happen without being crooked, without being shady or anything like that. Just doing good business, you know? And so they're okay. It, it takes time. It's, you know, when you're paying taxes and carrying costs for that time, insurance and whatever, and if you have financing arrangement and you have that expense as well, it becomes very tough. And, and I think that's where a lot of builders or, or speculators um, they end up not calculating that number. And I've been guilty of that as well, accurately. And it really eats into your bottom line and your profit. Six months to wait for a permit is a long time. I mean, investment wise with your, you know, equity partners and all kinds of things like that. But I mean, recently I had a guest on the show who, who said something that really just stuck with me. And he just said one of his best tools was patience in his toolbox. It's just, you have to have that patience, man. And if you don't have it, then you're going to lose as a result. So, I mean, you just got, I agree with you. I agree with you. You got to go by the rules, man. Just take your time and stay That's in the it. queue and everything like that. Yeah, for sure, man. You know, the guys that try to cut corners in that regard or any corners in general, but, uh, you know, in, in Long Island or in New York, there's a scandal every six months or a year. You know what I mean? Uh, our, our last county executive is, is, is out on bail for, uh, for, uh, on, on, you know, I don't want to name any names. I don't know. No, I know, but it's just corruption, you know right? But, but it's just, it's just funny because like all the people that used, like that guy took the fall for the people that he used to try to help out. And some of that stuff was building permits or getting somebody a job or whatever the case may be. It's not worth it. Yeah. I want to build something sustainable. I'm a young guy. You know what I mean? And I don't want, uh, one mistake can wipe out 10 years of good track record, yeah. you know? So at this point, I'm not even jaywalking, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just not doing it. I know some Canadians are actually going down to you guys, especially in Florida area and they're building down there. And I know that I've been invited to go down there as well too. Are you seeing that? Is that happening? Because I guess they're kind of fed up with, uh, either client or the process up here. And they figure that there might be better opportunities down there. Is America open arms to this? Are they allowing, you know, for you? I know there's specific visas that we can get yeah. so we can start working down there. Yeah. Um, and it's that's leading to me to your crew. Like, I want to talk about construction as well because you're still sure. doing construction. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. So, so are you guys seeing some of the Canadians coming down here and seeing opportunity to, to, to work in the States? So it's funny you asked me that. I actually have a Canadian client who's got family here. He's from the Toronto area. He's a builder there. Nice. Okay. And he's in a situation where he told me that the high end market is very stagnant in Toronto, that three to 4 million, which um, sounds like a ridiculous amount of money. But if you talk about the Toronto real estate market, that's your higher end mid market yes. spec level build. Yes. You know, and, and, and it's only up from there, you know, like you, a million bucks gets you a condo, if I'm not mistaken, that's you know, correct. If you're in no, the, you got it right. Yeah. You're in the right neighborhood. Right. So he said, after I build my own home, I want to look into building where you are. America is always going to be a very inviting place to do business, even though it's it's being run to the ground, having just traveled out of the country and coming back. You still realize that everyone's hopes and dreams, uh, the, every young person outside of America and Canada, for example, it, is still trying to get over here to have just yeah. a taste of the freedom that we yeah. have. So it's important to take that into context as well. I mean, we're freaking lucky, man. You know, if you really put your mind to something, you can come from another country anywhere in the world. And, and if you get lucky or have a little bit of help, you are well on your way to, to, to doing something uh, amazing. And um, sweat equity. And actually oh, lots of sweat equity. Yourself. That goes without saying. That's, if yeah. you're not willing, my, my baseline number is 10 years of basically like chest pains and anxiety. Yeah. That's how I found it. Yeah. You know, and I have a lot of friends in my business. And a lot of friends that own businesses and, 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 you know, my circle has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. To As the point it should. Where, we all know that. Know, yeah. And, and it was always small. Now it's like a dot, but like we all have the same pains and struggles. And like, if you're not willing to suffer for those 10 years, I believe that it's very hard to build something sustainable, you know? So back, back to the Tor Toronto market and people coming to Florida, Florida has gotten actually interesting fact. Miami has now become the most expensive 
residential market in the entire United States. So recently, pandemic, just like recently, this happened. Yeah, or? yeah. As of, as of this year, has become the most expensive wow, residential real estate market in the United States, um, surpassing New York, San Francisco, LA, and so on because of the influx. And so now, real estate is spreading out from Miami further, where it wasn't necessarily booming before. For example, I almost bought a house last winter in Fort Lauderdale. It's about uh, forty minutes, thirty minutes north of uh, downtown Miami. Right? Yeah. Beautiful suburb. Beautiful. Has a really nice downtown. High rises, condos. But then you drive five minutes, you've got parks and residential housing. Very nice. Very expensive. Yeah. And. It's so ridiculously saturated that I've already started to see prices coming down over there. And I'm so glad I didn't pull the trigger. I got COVID and Bell's palsy the same week in June. And I had con a contract signed for a house in Florida. And I have a 10-day window in Florida. It's not like New York where you get an attorney and you sign a contract. And, and there's like, you know, you have you basically just signed a contract in Florida, you know, after reviewing uh, with a realtor. You, yeah. There's no attorney involved. You just oh. sign a contract with a realtor. And it's a purchase contract and you have 10 days to back out. And I got Bell's palsy and COVID the same day. And I just, I was like, you know what? Doesn't feel right. feels like I'm forcing the issue. And I canceled my contract and I got my money back. No issues, no penalties, no nothing. No, 10 days. Not the case here, man. The moment that, you, yeah, it's different here in Toronto. Yeah, but, but but it's different here and, and different, and different where you in are. different in New York, different, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's much more, uh, it's much more um, involved to get into contract in New York. You hire an attorney, uh, you do an inspection. But here's the dangerous part of that compared to Florida. And this is why Florida was so attractive in addition to being very lax with the pandemic and everything. It's a homestead state. For people parking money from overseas, yep. as you know, it's it's a safe place. They can't take your house away from you. But in general, um, with, with in New York real estate, you have to you have to do your inspection and all of that while other people are still looking at the house. So contract review is happening, inspections happening, and during that whole week or ten day process, sometimes it takes that long. It can be done in two or three days if you're really just waving everything and saying, "I don't yeah. give a shit. I'll take it as it is." Yeah, but. That's the difference in Florida. You make a deal, you sign a contract that night, it's a done deal. The house is off the market. Now you have ten days to breathe. You know, in New York, it doesn't work like that, and I'm sure in Toronto, it doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't work like that as well. So let's let's talk a little bit about construction. You're still building, sure. and so how is it being that having that builder's hat on there? Uh, you knowing so much now compared to what you knew at on that first build. I, I'm I'm sure that a lot of tradespeople were probably trying to take you for a ride because they assumed that you didn't know anything. But nowadays, you know so much because you've been through it. You literally have physically been through it. Not that you read yeah. about it. You were there. Oh, you were in the yeah. trenches. You were working. Yeah. The differences between the two and, and what's going on these days. So I got away with things that you couldn't get away with now because builders, uh, contractors here, uh, subcontractors have, have had a good stream of work for the last 10 years. So unless you have a team that knows you already and uh, is willing um, to to work with you in ways that other subcontractors won't, nobody's going to allow you to handle your own material. Nobody's going to deal with a GC that thinks he knows what uh, that you need for plumbing or electric or whatever. Um, how I was able to kind of um, learn the business and not be taken for a ride was to control the material. So from the very beginning, I like. I'm not kidding, Manny. That didn't make people, you any any friends, though, huh? Uh, you know what? Most of the people that we work with still work with us. Okay, so and, they and understood. Still, and still are, uh, you know, and the few that got a little, like, uh, shady or funky have been phased out, just like anything else. You know, you yep. always have to keep an open mind to letting new trades into your circle. But at the same time, you know when you got a good one and you take care of them. Of course. You know? So we've had very little turnover overall. But... I was able to learn. If you wake me up out of my sleep, I kid you not, and put a plumbing fitting in my hand from the attic to the basement, I'll tell you exactly what it is and roughly what it costs. <laughs> I swear to God. No, you no, know, I, I believe it. I know. I know. You, you, you could wake me up out of my sleep and ask me, you know, uh, I could tell you everything about how, uh, you know, like a mid market. I'm not, I don't fancy myself a high end guy with, with all these gadgets, but the components that go into building a house, I can tell you the difference between, uh, uh, main breaker panel, a sub panel, why people, why we moved to arc faults, you know, why this breaker costs $50, you know, what's the difference between a, a plug on neutral breaker, like, you name it, anything, doesn't matter. And so controlling the material kind of got me 
that uh, education on the job. Um, even something as simple as making that extra phone call and ordering my own wood floor material, right? Simple, sounds simple, but there's a markup that comes when you buy it with somebody else, yeah. right? And I can tell you like, a lot has changed in terms of pricing, but like generally speaking at any given point in time, I could have told you what select versus select one would cost the difference, the difference between white oak and red oak. Uh, why after three and a quarter inches, we full travel glue all our wood floors because I don't want to hear about your cupping later on. You know, and, and be, oh my God, that's a lot of money. I'm like, yeah, the glue's going to cost you a dollar a square foot. So you want it or not? Because everybody loves white plank floor, flooring, but then the callbacks, you know, I've learned, I mean, we made mistakes, you know, we learned. You I learned from it, but you did the homework. Of, uh, you did, did your homework too, right? So then you know that on the next one, this is what we're going to do. 100%. It's going to cost I, this much more, but this is what we're going to do. Uh, yep. Right? And, and constantly applying that and getting better. And being transparent with my process, I definitely want to talk about social media too a little bit, YouTube especially. Yep. But getting comfortable with sharing the process um, came later. This five years in the trenches, I refused to have social media. As a matter of fact, the thought crossed my mind a bunch of times. But I always said to myself, I don't know enough to present myself as an authority. And I wasn't comfortable yet sharing my process, even though I could still go and talk to the first person who's outside. But I can knock on their door and say and have a conversation with them. And same with my realtor clients, the clients on the realtor side. But speaking but, to a mass audience is a different, absolutely a different approach, much different. Absolutely, approach. and yes. and I and I really enjoyed being able to learn the material and being able to understand how a house works because it takes a lot of the pain out of of the bidding process. It takes a lot of pain out of the bid process. And believe it or not, I'll admit it. I'm very much a one man band. I'm a very small operation. I GC every house I build, so I can only build like three or four a year. And I still place the HVAC material order. Mm -hmm. I still, I swear to God, my, my, one of my really good friends is a high-end builder. And uh, uh, his Instagram page is AMW Development. He's one of my really close friends. And he's like, I don't know how you run your business the way you do. And I'm just like, listen, I'm small enough where I get away with it. And it works. And you, know? you love it. You love doing it that way. You know, most days. Well, I, know, know, I know. There's a love and hate. Yeah, for sure. You know? um, but having that, um, going back to your question, having that background in construction and, and having gone that route, I have such a deep appreciation for the trades too. Um, a lot of people in my industry, especially the builders, uh, they think that all trades are created equal. And they think that price is is, is the only determining factor. Not, and yeah. They don't give a shit about how many nails the wood floor guy used or how yeah, sloppy the glue work just, is of the plumber. Just or more, I know. You know. I know. Just don't give a shit. Like, why would I use this if it costs this much more? And even if I explain it to them, I see their eyes. I see their like lack. It's in one ear and out the other, you know. But there's agents out there that are doing the same thing too, because they 100%. they're trying to do what you're doing on a much smaller scale and a lot less quality, just to make that property look and smell good enough to sell it. That's it. Same scale. I know. Yes. Same scale. We're doing a couple of times, you know, and they are too. And, and, and this is what pisses me off about the, the, the construction uh, investor spec builder side of the business in my market is that everybody with a couple of dollars has jumped into this chasing the easy money, right? Yes. And so they're on social media presenting themselves as experts. I've literally seen, I have literally seen, and YouTube changed my life, even though it's a much smaller subscribership. I have literally seen, uh, you know, people take that exact blueprint present themselves as an expert. And I'm still learning every day, man. Like I, I'm very much a student of the game, but I've seen a lot. And now you're an expert and now you're building homes and now you're presenting yourself as the best in Long Island. Like be humble, man. It's yeah, such an important, just, just a little humility goes a long way. And I've learned so much from all the different people I've met here, yourself and, 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 you know, guys like CK and the amazing, the JPM construction out, you know, and, and RPM builders and, and, you know, all these guys that are building, you know, AFT, my goodness, man, I know. Brad just builds the dopest shit in yeah. Arizona, period. You know, I, I look I, at guys like that. And I'm like, I don't know anything. I know. I'm just I, like, 
I'm like that. A little I, ant. I think you if know? you're on social media and you've given yourself the title of expert, you're not an expert. That's it. <laughs> someone else has to give you that title and it has to be more than one person like you have to earn that title and it's through being humble you know what i mean Absolutely. give it to yourself Absolutely. you're not one i'm sorry but you're not yeah i have a new i have a new strategy with all my 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 you know because the realtor business has become more than half of my business okay. and I, I have a very a very easy strategy now i tell people to go on my recent sales scroll through it pick one that you feel comfortable with and i'll connect you with that person pick it because you like the house pick it because it's more your market or your price point or the story resonates with you as to how this person found me but i'm not going to cherry pick my references call anyone and nine out of ten times they don't even ask after that yeah i know you know, I know. and i'm happy to connect them with we just i just did that the other day but you know good business humility and not presenting yourself as a know-it-all Go a long way. You'll go a lot further. A hundred percent. You'll go a lot further. Um, I wanted to ask you: um, Are you looking at different cities? Or are you staying in your own neck of the woods when it comes to projects? Are you considering options to go outside of state or different parts of the same state? Um, great. Uh, so the great question, and and I almost did uh, move to Florida recently. Uh, very much tying into your question about you know guys from Toronto going down to Florida too. Um, I think. I've always been the kind of person that if I can't be there before the firefighter, I don't want it. I'm the same way, man. I'm, I'm not the same way. Man. Unless they figure out how to clone you and get you there or hologram you there that you're there, you're walking until that technology is, is able. Yeah. It, it's kind of, you're going to lose what you built, what you built yeah. in the last decade. Yeah. You'll lose and it. I'm not there yet. Yeah. I'm not worth millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. So I'm not ready to take a risk to sink the ship because I never want to go back to where I was. You know, um, I was in a hole and, and even, even when I built my first new construction, I've got to share this story with you, yeah, yeah, with go. Your, your viewers, the first new house I ever built, I bought a piece of land. Okay. It was on a paper street that was not yet paved. It was the end of a street. And I wanted to, uh, develop a lot that wasn't developed. There was other homes on the block, but the street kind of just ended and then it became woods. So I bought this lot with every penny I had. I'd like to, uh, at the time I was worth about. 300 grand. I spent 200 on the lot. I had a hundred left over <laughs> and I didn't have enough money to build a house. So this was back in, I want to give you a real relevant time frame. Uh, 2013, okay. 2013 okay. going into 2014 and the hundred K that I had left over, I put into Forex because my friend was making a killing and I just wanted to shadow his trades. And of course he went on the worst run of his life. I fired him halfway through <laughs> Thought I learned Forex and lost the rest. Of course. All hundred. Ouch. I had three grand left over. I took my wife to Cancun and I said, baby, we're fucking done. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're done. Lesson uh, was learned. I learned. I, I learned. Lesson learned. Yes. I learned that day. I, we've all been I there. Like, we've all been there. We've all been there, we all been there man. That Lesson was my learned. defining moment. Yes. I am in control from now on. I don't care how long it takes. I'm never deviating off my path, period. And that day I went out, uh, by the way, I bought this piece of land, no water main, no sewer, no gas. You have to bring everything. I did everything. not include the water main line item. I have pictures, I'm gonna send them to you. Uh, I did not include extending the water main into my line item bid, okay? $40,000 that I did not anticipate <sighs> just for extending the water main, Ouch. fire hydrant, I was Ouch. a kid. My dad came to my job site. I was the first one to do a new construction, right? My dad comes to the job site and he goes, Shazad, I, I'll never forget this. There's very little uh, validation you hear from your first generation dad, you know? And my dad came to my job site. He just looked me in the face and he goes, I do not have the stomach for what you're doing right here. <laughs> and the whole road was cut up. The whole road was cut up. I didn't have shit, bro. I was living in a shitty rental with my wife. I didn't have shit, okay? And... I, I, you know, I had a nice Beamer because that was my one splurge, but otherwise I didn't have shit. Yeah. And, and, and I went all in and I borrowed 300 grand from one of my friends, unsecured bro. I had the best street credit, man. My friends loved me and he owned a car business. He had a lot of money. And I was like, listen, I'll, I'll cut you a check for this much when I sell it. And he gave me a check and I built the house and I was in so deep that I knocked on the neighbor's door across the street. He had a little bungalow at the end of the block, bought that and made a deal with my first investor. I didn't pay for any of that. I didn't have the money. So I had to bring in an investor for that. But the reason I brought in an investor for the property across the street was because now I got this brand new house on this new paper street with this piece of shit bungalow across the street. 
And selfishly, I didn't want to be the only schmuck at the end of the block, right? Yeah. So I brought in an investor yeah. and we built the house and I sold it and I didn't make a lot of money. But that education that I got, you learned. Forget it, bro. And I never deviated after that. So after I sold that house, I bought my own house where I'm sitting right now, my humble little abode. And I bought a cash. It wasn't mortgageable. It was a real shit box. Builders were fighting over it. I bought it at the end of 2014. And after I did that, I basically wiped out my capital. But I never wanted to feel homeless again for the rest of my life. So I tell my wife, she gets so mad at me. I'm like, I swear to God, I could die in this house. I swear to God, like, you don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> she hates me. And, and, but but and, you're not house poor either. Like, no, you know, like a lot of people. Poor, my house, well, I was. Okay. But you're I not, was right? So That's, house poor. Yeah. So, I, I, dude, if I tell you the truth, I took out $80,000 on my credit cards to buy the materials to finish this renovation. I dug myself in a huge hole. Yeah. Okay. And building houses with investors one at a time, my realtor business was shit, shit. I was selling maybe one house a year. Okay. Wow. I wasn't a realtor. I had a real estate license, but I simply had that. So I didn't have to pay the commission when I sell the house. Of course. And I, and I knew I could be a good realtor, but nobody believed me yet. You know what I mean? Because I was just a kid. I'm 35, bro. Look at me. Imagine they they wouldn't I have looked at you. I know. They would have not. 20, have yeah, 12 years ago. I know. No way. I, probably I was they would never have taken you seriously, man. Never. No, no, no. way. And, and so, but that's the fire that gave you to keep on moving forward. 100%. And, yeah. and I, I, I'm going to give you, I want to give you guys value, right? I want to tell you guys the business side of it. I was building an entire spec home to make 30 to $40,000. My cut, my cut. Okay. Wow. And sometimes it was less. I did a full gut reno in 2012 and made $10,000 full gut reno. Okay. Real, I'm going to give you real numbers. I did. I built that house, the two, the two houses on the dead end that I developed. I had to get the county town department health uh um sewer water gas this department that department lighting trees well you i i still have their numbers in my phone to this day some of these people and i had only made forty thousand on one house and like 75 or eighty thousand on the other and the 75 or 80 was a complete all in for a year and a half where i didn't know what was going to happen i thought i was going to die it's not a lot of money it's not a lot of money, not, you know, man. and after I bought my house and I gave that kid back his 300 grand plus, you know, 30, you know, 10%, whatever the hell it was, I basically had enough money to buy my house and I built one house at a time, making that 30, 40, 50,000, you know, as my cut because I had an equity split, right? I didn't want the risk of hard money. Yeah. I didn't want the Smart. risk. Smart. But I made less money too on some deals. Of course. Right. Well, you're but you're not, you're not investment. carrying all this interest either, right? That's the thing. No. Did and, you and, and your wife sit years. down and, and calculate what the educational costs were? Because you were learning so much as a result, even though you didn't make that much money and you oh, can I, compare I, it to I someone working at fast get, food, but you know, you made a lot of money in other ways. I got paid to get a PhD. Yes. And it doesn't work that way for a lot of people. And I'm very mindful and thankful for that opportunity, you know, because um, I got a PhD in the street first. Then I got a PhD in construction and no one can take that away from me, you know, but, but going back to building, like I literally built a whole house for a year plus. And remember, it's not just building the house. It's finding the deal. I did not take a commission on the front end, did not. So I'm like wooing my investor by saying, I don't want a penny until I actually finish a job. Then I'm building the house before I build the house permits architect revisions filing running the paperwork down check 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 i'm not kidding if you, i want to show you around my desk right now every single it doesn't matter like what i do man i want to show you like every receipt gets entered in these are yep. the two receipts i didn't enter yep. yet every single thing is still my problem and i love it you know but 50,000 40,000 and how many houses can you build a year two three you know at that point you're not yeah. getting that many good deals so I wasn't making a lot of money and I had a very patient wife, you know, and I was working like a donkey, like an absolute donkey, piece of shit pickup truck, uh, you know, wearing the same shit every day. Um, and this is why I respect the trades because I know what it takes. I'll never treat them like an asset. Yes. They're not assets. They're people. Yes. So as long as you're getting what you want from me and I'm getting what I want from you and we're making a fair business exchange, I'm happy. But otherwise, one's a loser and one's a winner. And that's not how I run my business. 
you know. But that's but, how the majority of the industry runs the business. Especially here. Especially right. here. Yeah, I know. It's, um, it's bad that way. But, but I chipped away, man. And honestly, I, I was making so little money even until 2017 or 2018 that I almost quit a few times. 2017, end of 2017, end of 2018. Even going to the pandemic, I was sitting on three houses that I built with my investors. I was all in personally with a lot that I bought at, um, in Belmore. It was a little $250,000 lot, which also changed my life. Was a nice was a nice find um, through Instagram. And I definitely want to talk to you guys about that. You found uh, that client through Instagram? I found that lot. That lot through Instagram. Yeah. All well, right, so I, share, I, share, share I, that I story. It. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that in, in just one sec. That, that, that 2018, 2019, 2020 period, that's the period where I believe that most people would have quit and where I, I really should have quit at that point. Yeah. But only now, man, and I tell my followers this stuff, I keep it real, man. Like I just did my first subdivision and I shared it. I didn't act like I had done it 10 times before. I knew the process like I had done it a bunch of times before, but I share it and I, and I really started making money for real the last couple of years, you know, and I don't try to act like anything otherwise, but, but definitely let's uh, segue into social media. Yeah. Let's uh, do that, man. Give me one sec. Is that all right? right? Can we pause? No, for no, go sec? ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 sure. I'm a ghetto operation over here, man. What can I say? <laughs> no, nah, it's all good, man. It's the information, man. That's what's yeah. key. Yeah. Parama. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about, uh, let's, let's get into social media because I've had a love Love, hate, 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 hate relationship with social media. Uh, so go ahead, man. Let's let's. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts on that. So um, I started my Instagram page about five or six years ago, uh, and it was very much a slow, steady grind. Um, unfortunately, if you're not selling misinformation or you're not selling some get rich quick scheme, it's very hard to grow quickly in my space. Yeah. And I missed the early boom. The, and I don't make any excuses, but there was a, a more organic time on the gram when if you had good quality content, you were going to get in front of more eyeballs organically. Unfortunately, I missed that window. And so it was a very slow, steady grind. Um, but the most life changing thing for me was um, once I had a few thousand followers on Instagram, a kid hit me up my age. I shouldn't say kid. And he was like, listen, I think that the one piece missing from your uh, content is video and more so putting your face on camera and this is not me man i'll be straight with you like i i, I still get uncomfortable taking selfies in public with no, my I wife know. i, I, I get yelled at for it all the time my wife goes you have a vlog you're on instagram every day and and you give me a hard time about a picture and she's so <laughs> right you know she's so right but this is anxiety just takes over you know and so social media, that making that transition and, and starting my vlog on YouTube, and you said something very interesting. You said, you know, 270 some odd episodes and, and you know, grinding it out. Um, I made 70 episodes straight, one a week wow. for 70 weeks straight yeah. with, this, with, this, with this person. And uh, shout out to Matter Visual. He was a, a good friend of mine. I still a good friend, but uh, we, you know, everybody goes their own separate ways at yep. some point. Yep. But we had a great run together. And um, I learned a lot and he was very much like me. So we butted heads a little bit, but that's fine. And what happened was I was begging for views, begging, please, like on Instagram, please watch my video, you know, please uh, get me to hundred subscribers so I can actually have like a way to like contact you. Like, I don't even know stupid rules. Right. And during the pandemic, I noticed that some of my videos started to get a little more views and I had already started making video tours of my houses of before, during and after before the pandemic. And when they locked us down, I was sitting on some inventory and what that those videos allowed me to do was showcase my house without making in-person contact. Yes. And it was a very detailed video where you really felt like you saw the house. So I give you 50 professional photos and I give you this full walkthrough tour with my big ass mug on it. And, 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 and I explain things as we go through it, not just a, 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 a visual representation of the floor plan. Right. And, Little by little, that started to grow. And I only have a few thousand subscribers, maybe 3,000, 3,500 in that range. But they're real. And what I never That's, knew, yeah. what I never knew was that people actually, I know we all go to YouTube for how to's, right? But what I didn't know was that I was going to end up dominating a very small hashtag called Long Island Real Estate. So you're only allowed three or four hashtags on YouTube or five maybe. And 
Um, mine are simple. I, I give the game away, man. I don't care. Long Island real estate, builder, broker. Okay? Just throw it out there. Short description. Link to my Instagram page. And just kept making videos. And kept making videos. And didn't do any special SEO. Didn't do anything. Didn't spend a penny besides the, you know, it was a big commitment to make four episodes yep. a month. I was yep. spending maybe $1,200 a month to make these episodes hours every week, right? And getting nothing for it. Nothing. And, and you won't get anything for it in the beginning. You won't. Nope. And, I, and I just kept plugging away. And during the pandemic, I started to get messages through my contact form where people would click the link and send me an email. Hey, I'm looking for a house here. Or, hey, I saw your video X, Y, Z, right? And now, even though it's only a few thousand people, I have people come up to me in my local area, my market. I go out to dinner or whatever. Yo, I watch all your videos on YouTube or, or um, I follow you on Instagram, right? And the point of this is what I'm, what I'm trying to get across is that it doesn't have to be a million followers. There's people with millions of followers that can't sell 50 t-shirts when their market, when, when their t-shirt drops. Okay. It's about creating in, when somebody follows me, I view that as an opportunity to create a relationship. Yes. I click on their page. I don't follow everybody back. Cause that's just weird. Yeah. I don't follow back my friend's wives. Cause that's just weird. weird. You know what I mean? <laughs> I keep it real, man. Yeah. You know, but I look at all, and you know what I say to myself? Instagram is very simple and it's, it's, a, it's, it's people say it's a dying platform. It's, it's, it's that you just got to change with the times, man. Yes, that's what it is. And the reality is, is that it's, it's, it's a free tool. So how much can we ask for, for something that we're not paying anything for? Matter of fact, Instagram not pays for my coffee. I hate spending that $4 a day and I get paid for my reels. That 120 bucks a month that I get for my reels now covers my bad coffee habit. So, so, so I feel like I'm, I'm I, they're paying me. So what am I going to ask for? You know? No, but you, you got it right. And I totally agree with you that I rather have 2000 followers on a YouTube or an Instagram channel where I'm speaking to 20% of them and they're real people, whether they be local or across the country, then have 200,000 followers where I'm only speaking to maybe a thousand of them. And we're not real. We're not like, they're just basically picking your brain about certain things. I rather no have that connection. I rather have that connection, huh? man. Yeah. Yes. And there's no potential for a future relationship there, yes. you know? Um, but most importantly, I was able to share my process, give my, reduce that response time where you can actually speak to somebody that's a, you know, an expert in the field, instant gratification for the most part, you know? And I just, I, I, I kept it real. I chipped away little by little. And now it's just almost this like self-feeding machine yep. because I share my content and, uh, you know, I look at my analytics, right? They're very simple analytics on Instagram. 70% of my followers are 25 to 44. Who's buying homes in the next 10 years? That demographic. They're the ones so, that want to buy homes. They need to figure out how to do that. Yes. There's kids, there's kids that followed me five years ago that told me when they were in college and when they graduate, they're going to call me because I'm, I, they know me, and right? They, they will, they will definitely do that. And I see them becoming doctors. I see them becoming lawyers. I see, you know, and it, it, another bone I have to pick is I love seeing when you create a relationship with somebody, relationship with somebody. And it's, I think it's weird to follow everybody back. Like I'm, I'm trying to provide a service, right? And it's a free service. But I'll notice that people that I've mentored or that I've spoken to over the years, I bet I haven't, you know, heard from this person in a while. They get their real estate license or flip a house and now they unfollow you because they're an expert. Are you fucking <laughs> kidding me? I know I shouldn't care about that. Well, that's that the shit, thing is like in the in the beginning, I didn't care. I never had I, a, a a thought of caring. Did you care about in the beginning that you're revealing too much? that you're giving up too much. I think that if you are a one trick pony, you only have one good angle or one good trick or something like that on the shelf, then you're gonna care and you're gonna wait, you're gonna worry about someone else is gonna take your business and move from it. But I think that if like yourself and like myself, We've got plenty of tricks in the bag. We've got plenty oh. of ideas. I'll share all this stuff and then all of a sudden take it, work with it, build from yeah. it. But I'm yeah. already working on stuff that's going to happen tomorrow, next year. That's I'm how it works, it. man. I, I Every time I get an idea, I write it down in my notepad on my yeah. phone because that reel is going to help somebody else to get through whatever the hell they're dealing with on that day, right? And, you know, as far as like, like she, she, uh, revealing too much, my first YouTube blog, my choppy ass, uncomfortable hat, glasses, hoodie over my head, hiding from the camera. 
I took you to three job sites. Yeah. I took you in the hole where we were pouring the footing. Yeah. I exposed myself to criticism. And you know what I realized? It's not as negative a place as people make it out to be. No, it's not. Because if you're not an asshole, people will see that. And I'm a little abrasive, a little rough around the edges. I know I'm very direct with a lot of people and it pisses some people off. But for the most part, I don't project myself as an asshole and I don't get a lot of negativity. And every once in a while, you'll get a troll, uh, you know. Let but, them. Shazad, this is this is what I do. I just do this. It. That's all. And, and, just and like on. get the but, fuck off my shoulder. That's it, but, man. But, yeah. And the first episode, I took you in there. This is the rebar. This is the footing. Yes. This is what we're doing. Because we're you want to show them. You're not we're, hiding anything. We're, we're pinning this extension into the house. There's epoxy in the rebar. We have three inspections over the next 10 days. Right away, man. And people's minds were blown. Blown. Because I don't want to say no one had done it before. But no one had done it before in this kind of mom and pop way in my market. Yeah, yeah. And that's what matters in my market. So now there's people copycatting, copycatting. And I don't care because I'm 100 episodes in and 30 builds in. And my market, my, I've established my little niche, right? Yeah. So having good relationships with my competition is going to help me when my client needs a house, right? Or when I'm selling a house. I haven't burned every bridge in town. So people feel like I'm approachable. You know what I mean? And, and they so will. People, they will approach you. They will I'm talk to you, man. And, and and I don't, I I work so hard, man, that I just don't have time to go to this event and schmooze with these people or hop. I used to try to do all that. I went and met Brian Serhant and I, I went and did this and I went and did that. It's a waste of fucking time. It's funny you say that, man. I just got invited to an event. They're like saying, listen, why don't we meet at the Hockey Hall of Fame? We're going to actually have an event there. There's going to be a lot of stuff happening. Why don't we talk about it then? And I'm like, no. Why don't we just get together and sit down and discuss it? Because then we can have so much more productive talking yeah. about what we want to achieve here if you're on board i'm on board everybody else is on board i don't need the distraction of a social environment to do this i rather just focus on task at hand task yeah. at hand simple as that yeah man. yeah and, and we could do that over dinner that's not that's not that's not impossible but a function but, or going here and make it like yeah. a double duty no one's going to sacrifice and i guarantee you social will trump over the the, the actual work that you want to achieve it's very and important. i have and, and frankly like the little time that we have, I want to spend it with my family, with my nephews. You know, I, I want to um, go places. I work 340, 350 days a year. That's a real number. That's crazy, man. That's a real number. I'm not a bullshitter, man. I yeah. keep it 100%. And as a realtor, you never get to take the hat off, you know. Um, but it is what it is. You know, it's 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 part of the gig. And I, I, I've, I've had to draw lines with certain clients. And, and they know, like, when, like, I've had it. But for the most part, people respect, uh, you know, the people that you actually, your actual clients respect your work-life balance. It's the random people that text you at 11 o'clock that say, hey, can you show this house tomorrow? But, you know, it pisses me off in the moment. And then I realize that I better off not responding is, is, is the. Shazad, I must say that what I respect about you is that you are growing with the times. Like you understood what the process was. You never looked for the easy way in or out or up. You actually grew and it, it gave you an opportunity to learn from it too. And you yeah. knew that there was going to be bad. You knew that there was going to be suck. Uh, and I, then, I, but I you also know knew there was going to be good. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and all of a sudden you're like going, okay, but this is what I learned. There's that PhD. This is what yeah. I picked up. And now you've got clients that have been following you, have maybe met you. I love, you know, crossing paths with people, DMs going, Definitely. been following you since the beginning. I can only imagine I look back and think to myself, okay, what did I say in the very beginning? And it just it resonated with certain people. So, yeah. you know, listening to the first show, listening to the recent shows, you just grow with the times. It's really, yeah. really important to grow with the times, man. Yeah, and stay humble and yes. stay a student. Um, and don't let a couple of dollars change who you are. Because the minute you get like that, people see it, man. People know. People are very intuitive. People will meet me and they'll say things about me that like, oh, hey, like this is why I follow you, right? And and it's it's you never think about it when you make the content because you forget that like it's built into who you are already, right? So you're already hitting certain notes you don't even realize you're hitting. But then when people tell you, it's like, okay, this is not a waste. Like, this is why I'm doing this. This is working and it's benefiting me. 
And I'm also benefiting other people. I know people that have come into this business that have become realtors and started building houses because they started following me five or six years ago. And that's pretty freaking cool. You know, um, I, I got a question for you before we head into the 12 questions here. Yeah. Do you see a rash of all these people that were looking for the quick way in and the quick money jumping off that ship once the shit starts to go south? They're dead. Man. They're, they won't know to sustain, right? They won't know what to do. They'll panic. Is that not what's going to happen? I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. They're going to go to a different hustle. A very easy example is looking at the mortgage, uh, the mortgage business uh, in 2004, 2005 in the States. I was in high school with looking at kids one or two years older than me. I shit you not, man. I had a $60 Huffy and I rode that thing to the supermarket and CVS and I worked for six or seven dollars an hour. And I didn't, I didn't ask anybody for shit. And I was very angry firstborn kid. So I bought the clothes on my back. I bought, put the food in my stomach. I didn't talk, I, you know, I had a lot to learn and I, I didn't understand certain things uh, about life at that time. And there were kids a year or two older than me driving S 500s and selling mortgages. And, and you know what happened after the mortgage bus, oh, man? I know, we know history. I know, we know. They found another hustle. Yeah. They crashed and burned. Yeah. They moved back into a basement apartment. They went from the high rise to the basement overnight. And I don't wish that on anybody. But when you're stealing from people, you're going to get what's coming to you. It's true. I, I put my head on the pillow at night and I fall asleep, thank God, in 30 seconds. <laughs> you know? And that's priceless. Yes, it is, man. You, you know, Valuable. like I don't look over my shoulder. I don't worry about somebody embarrassing me at an open house because I did the wrong thing by them. I, the thought doesn't cross my mind. And I made a little less money as a result of that. But I believe in the long run, I'm definitely going to be better off. Definitely. All right. So, uh, so let's get on uh, the YouTube channel again. It's under Pinnacle Real Estate, right? And also on IG, oh. it's Pinnacle Real Estate, right? That's it. That's Spelled it. out. No, no, no periods, no commas, no dashes. And that's where you'll find all this valuable content. Trust me that you will learn more than one or two nuggets, man. That's a fact. Thank you. That's what's going to happen. So 12 questions of construction. You ready for this, man? Yes. What is your favorite construction word? Certificate of occupancy. It's not one <laughs> occupancy. word. Occupancy. Yes, that's very true, man. What is your least favorite construction word? Stop work order. I got one back in the day. <laughs> Did you? I've gotten one. I've gotten one, and it was it was by <laughs> fluke. They were inspecting another section of a building, and all of a sudden, they just stopped at where we were working, and we didn't have it. And there you go. So yeah. it happens. Learning. Uh, what turns yeah. you on in construction? What's that? What turns you on in construction? I love the fact that every day I can see progress. I love the fact that my OCD gets very much satisfied by seeing a clean job site. I love seeing progress. It's that's the most that's the most rewarding part. The ability to see something take shape. Nice. What turns you off in construction? We already talked about it. All the sliminess. Yeah, there is a lot you of know, it. It's you know, there. it's and, there. And, it's there. But it allows us to stand out. So we'll leave it. Let them be. What's your favorite curse word? Can be used in a phrase. I'm working on this part of me. I have a very foul mouth. I really try to be better about it, but I, I unnecessarily use the F word quite a bit. <laughs> and I'm working on it. I'm sometimes to be it's person. sometimes it's needed. Sometimes yeah. it's needed. Yeah. What is your favorite vehicle? Anything in the world? I've been a BMW guy since I was a kid. I bought my first one on eBay in 2003 for like five grand. Um, my favorite car ever or like what anything anything in the world if i had to choose any car and have to drive it every day it would be a porsche 911 turbo s i think it's more well-rounded than any of the other super exotics and i think that it's just it checks all the boxes for me and you can drive it in the winter uh, yeah you can with the right set of tires, you can take it up a mountain. Yes, you can. Uh, what's your least favorite vehicle in the world? My least favorite vehicle. I love cars, man. I don't. Really there isn't one that you don't love. I really hate any specific car. I hate the G wagon right now for what it's become. The image of it. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's what you a mean. Great truck. Just like I hate the Range Rover for what it's become. Yeah. Right. It's the same yeah. thing. It's the same. Yeah. It's the same. You know what? You know what? No, I have a clear answer. 
our Range Rover because you pay all this money to look like a cool guy and it's in the shop all the time. It's an absolute piece of shit and off warranty. <laughs> it's a disaster. A Range Rover off warranty is worse. Than I'm a not disagreeing with you, man. It's so it's, it spends more time on the hoist than it does on the road. That's man. it. There's a clear answer for you. You know what? I did I, have an answer. I know. What, what construction sound or noise do you love? I love the sound of sheetrock screws because it lets me know that we have a clear run until the final inspection. Uh, you're going right into the finish. Yeah, that zip, zip, yeah, zip. Right when I hear right that, in. I know that I passed about 10 inspections and nobody set in foot in my house again until the final inspection. So get out and stay out. Nice. So what construction sound or noise do you hate? I hate the pounding rain, man. Uh, I've learned a lot about water. I've learned a lot about how water would be probably the reason why I die a few years younger than I am right now. Uh, that, that I should have otherwise if I wasn't in construction. But the pounding rain and learning about drainage and learning about dry wells and learning about soil permeability, uh, the pounding rain used to give me terrible anxiety. And even now to this day, when I hear pounding rain, my, I feel the knot in my stomach from just thinking about window wells and basements getting filled up with water or dumb shit like that. That's definitely my least Mother favorite. nature, mother nature has her wicked ways, man. It just That's is going to happen. You got to respect nature. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt one day? This is not something that I could possibly be att attempt, but I would love to have been an NBA basketball player. <laughs> really? Huh? I yeah, I love the idea. What is your favorite team? You New Yorker? I'm a Knicks fan. Yeah. I'm yeah. Fan. yeah it okay. Sucks. It's not easy, but uh, they got a good young squad, and they're going to be going places now. I I, I know that sounds like so cliche, <laughs> but they've actually built a young, good squad, and I'm excited about about. Uh, nice. being a Knicks fan in the next five, 10 years. What profession would you never like to do? I would never want to be a doctor. It's hard. Uh, it's hard. I have a lot of friends and family that have become doctors. Uh, it was very much the cliche profession to become coming from my background. That's why my license plate is redoc. It's a joke and it's like an inside thing that people, only people that know me will understand. Yeah. And when people stop me to ask me what it is, it's a great way to market and talk about it, but I would never want to be a doctor. You know, it's just not for me, man. And the last question, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? You got me going religious now. This is your fault, man. Heaven exists. We got to do our best to get there. And I just want to get there. As long as that gate's open for me and my scale is 5149, just the fact that I got, I don't even need to hear words of affirmation. I just know that I wasn't wrong and that this life is not for nothing and that we got to answer for every goddamn thing that we do. And, well and I feel like if more people live their life that way, we'd have a better planet. Very well you know? said, man. Shazad. Very well said, man. Dude, anything else? I think we touched upon so much, man. I love it. I, I, I'd love to get you back on the show like a year from now oh, anytime, man. and see anytime. where it's happening. I did, I did, yeah, I, I'm sure, man. Anytime. I, well, I would love to uh, get into the realtor, more into the realtor side of the business and explain. I mean, I'll tell you briefly. Yep. Uh, being, being a builder first allowed me to provide so much value as a realtor. During this last couple of years, I've helped dozens of buyers get into homes that otherwise would have really just been swinging for the fences with a blindfold on. You know, you go with a realtor, they're just trying to miss sale. Buyers agents are usually the newer agents, right? Because they haven't established their business enough to become listing agents. Yeah, It's a tough time to be a buyer's agent. So usually when you start out in the business, you're a buyer's agent first. You know, and if you're really, really starting at the bottom of the totem pole, you're doing rentals, but there's not a lot of those where I am. So typically you come in the business and you're a buyer's agent. I flip that on its head. I tell my buyers that this is the most important decision you'll ever make. How the hell are you going with Aunt Sally? Aunt Sally hasn't sold the house in 27 years. You know, let's go to the house. Let's quietly look at it. We don't need to insult anybody, but then we're going to have a conversation about what I see. The HVAC, the boiler, the roof. The windows, you know, people don't realize, oh, the windows look all right. That's a $25,000 job when you go to change exactly. those windows, exactly. you know, yeah. uh, what about the, what about the foundation? Am I going to have water issues, drainage issues, grading issues? The minute you walk out of that house, if you're my client, you feel like you uh, don't need to spend the $600 on a home inspection. And I tell my people do the home inspection, but not until we actually find the right house and we have an accepted offer. There's no reason to throw money away. Yes. If it's a piece of shit house, I'm going to tell you, and yeah. that's it. Because I'm not going to try to shove a house down your throat, you know. So one day we'll talk about that side of the business. 
I'm very open when it comes to like the analytics and the, the, the cost of doing things. I, I don't think that you're going to get a, you're not going to give anything away by telling somebody what things no, cost. I tell mean, them the truth and then they can yeah. make their decision. And guess what? They're going to be your next marketing opportunity. That's they it. will share what you they've experienced with you. And then you'll Absolutely. get another client and another client Absolutely. instead of being shady, man. There's no reason nah, to be shady, shady at all. Shady doesn't work, man. No, nah, man. Pleasure. Thank you so Thank much, you. man. Honestly, Thank you. Thank you for enjoy me. the rest of the day. And I really appreciate Absolutely. you being on the show, Thank man. You. Everybody check Absolutely. them out again on YouTube. It's pinnacle real estate. You'll find them on YouTube on IG, reach out to him, DM him, Thank leave you. him a comment on the, all the, the videos that he's got out there. And honestly, do yourself a huge favor and watch all that content. Cause you are going to learn, man, Tradesperson or a homeowner or potential future real estate agent, man. So thank, thank you, you, man. Thank you so My much. All right. Thank you, Angelina. And we are out of here.